Hey, Coach, thanks for joining me today on this simple coach-coach interview. do appreciate it. I know we've been going back and forth um, on that, you know, that uh, anti-social media platform known as the Marketplace of Ideas, Twitter. Um, so appreciate you taking the time, and we're finally able to connect. I'm really excited for that. Yeah, and thank you very much for having me. All right, so um, I think I got this right. You've been or at least the head coach six years at Hampton, Sydney. That's correct. Just over six years now. Um, can, can you just talk about your soccer journey and how you ended up in the spot that you're, you're at? Sure. So I'm from Northern Virginia originally, um, grew up there and I ended up going to, uh, the university of Mary Washington played there for four years. Uh, and then while I was, in college, I started coaching in some different capacities with local club teams or individual sessions at the high school level. Um, and then I was able to get on as a volunteer assistant with Mary Wash for a couple of years. Um, and then from there, I was fortunate enough to go down to Lynchburg College and get a graduate assistant coaching position there, which I was supposed to stay for three years, but I ended up leaving after two. Mm -hmm. And I went up to the University of Maine at Farmington to be a head coach oh, up right. there. Yeah. Um, I did that for four years, and then from there, I had always kind of hoped to get back down to Virginia in mm -hmm. some way, just because this is where I'm from, this is where my family was, and Hampton Sydney came open, and yeah, I was fortunate to get the job here, and, and I'm six years in. Yeah. So, it's, it's you, been great. So you were, you were at Lynchburg? I mean, that's great pedigree, right? And, and Mary Wash, don't get me wrong. Like, um, trying to connect with those two as well to coaches to talk about their programs. I, but um, I, I can help. I can help you with that. <laughs> yeah. That's what I like to hear. I don't, I don't influence. I let you do the influencing. So um, yeah. Um, anyhow, those are, I mean, great, great, um, great starting points. Did you, did you just have a, have a, um, an itch to get up North to, to do the head, was it the head coaching job that you wanted or was it, um, that you had something that you wanted to pursue up there? Yeah, n no, basically, um, I, I think pretty quickly I realized this is what I wanted to do. Um, and you know, the best way to learn is, is to be a head coach and have to do things like trial by fire a little bit. <laughs> so yeah, I, I was really enjoying my experience at Lynchburg, the head coach mm -hmm. there, coach Jaeger, um, was great to me. Uh, and it was great from a developmental standpoint. It was the same thing at Mary Washington with Coach Gordon, another guy that had been in the game for a long time that I learned a ton from. Um, but, but I knew for me the next step was to go be a head coach somewhere, really learn that way. So, yeah, when, when the job came open in Maine, um, it, it was a period of time where I was looking at certain head jobs. And ironically, uh, Coach Gordon from Mary Washington, he had started his coaching career back in, like, I don't know, even 1970 something at that school at UMF. Um, so when I was looking to apply there, I brought it up to him and he was like, absolutely. This is a great place, great athletic pedigree, great little town. Um, so, so yeah, I went up there. I'd never been to Maine in my life. Um, <laughs> I flew to Portland. I drove the hour and a half to Farmington, which you seem like you're in the middle of nowhere on the way there. Um, but no, it was great. It was a perfect fit. And, and it was, um, it was, it was the perfect place for me to start out. There's a ton of great support system there. The head coaches there at the time had a great group, very experienced group. So I learned a lot from them. Um, so no, I'd never been to Maine in my life. I just wanted to be a head coach. <laughs> and I, I was lucky to, to find a great home in, in UMF. So, so then, so then December, January, February must've been quite the shocker in year one. <laughs> have, you, have you been up there Yeah. Uh, at that point in the year? Yeah, it's holy mackerel. <laughs> yeah, it, it snows in November, um, and it stays on the ground until April. So that that was uh, an adjustment, but you get used to it. And, um, you know, it was a blessing in disguise because our team played a ton of futsal because we had no other choice, and it benefited the guys greatly, I think. So, yeah. you know, it was, a, it was, a, it was different, but I, I enjoyed it. I embraced it. I embraced my time being up there, and I still go up there at least once a yeah. year. All right, so let me just ask you, I ask every coach this um, because I'm genuinely curious. Do you, do you think in your time in coaching, 
even when, when you started out as an assistant all the way to now, do you think players have gotten better? Definitely. Um, yeah, definitely. Uh, the, the game has evolved, and the, it's evolved at the youth level, and, and that's showing up, uh, I think, more and more, and I think you see it in lots of different ways. I mean, even as we're going through the process with guys right now, um, a couple of years ago, when, when you talk to players, like, what position do you play, that type of thing, and many times they would played one position in one system their whole time, generally a 4-3-3, because that was the trend. Now yeah. these guys are, are so much more well-versed in different systems and understanding their role within those systems. So I think, and then there's probably, you know, they've improved technically, um, since I played too, for sure. But I do think just the having more of an awareness of some of the different nuances tactically um, mm -hmm. is definitely a, a way the games evolve from, from years ago. And hopefully it'll continue that way. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a – I always ask, like, are they getting better, right? And it's Which would be a terrible thing and considering all the discussions and the talk about developing players. If they weren't getting better, I'd really have a – that would be a real bummer. Um, all right, so so I know because I've spoken to some of your uh, you know brother coaches in the ODAC that the ODAC is a little strange. Um, uh, I, I would just I'd welcome. What's your what's your perspective on the ODAC competitiveness? Just sort of the interesting nature where you don't play everybody. Um, just because there's what 13, 14 teams, something like yeah, that. Yeah, there's 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 thirteen of us. Thirteen, yeah. Um, and I, yeah, I know you've talked to Mike quite a bit. Uh, yeah. Flues Great and, guy. Yeah. Absolutely. And those two are way more well versed in like the breakdown of strength of mm -hmm. schedule and all the mm -hmm. analytics behind it that hopefully help us get multiple teams into the NCAA tournament every year. But yeah, so the ODAC in my time, it's been six years. I think it seems like our schedule changes every year, or at least the format mm -hmm. of it. Um, but it's because we're putting a lot of time into it and what's going to set us up the best to get multiple teams into the tournament and help mm -hmm. everybody strength the schedule across the board. But correct, we, we do not play everyone um, for a period of time. We were only playing eight teams in the mm -hmm. conference. Now we're playing 10. Um, so you're missing out on a couple opponents. Which is fine, um, and I think for most of us, our geographic location is, is such that it's not a difficult thing to schedule games, um, yeah. so it gives you just a little more flexibility to boost your SOS or, or prepare your team for whatever your aspirations are for that season. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, that, that's definitely a, a unique thing, but um, yeah, it's, 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 a, it's a tough conference too, and it's really strong top to bottom. But, yeah, we, we want to make sure we set ourselves up to try to get multiple teams in an NCAA, NCAA tournament every year. Is that a league objective as well? I, it probably depends who you ask. Um, <laughs> I think I'd say yes. Um, I mean, that that's the goal. You want to have as strong a conference as possible yeah. um, and make it so, you know, if a team has a great season, then they get rewarded. Um, and they don't just have to win the conference tournament. So, again, I think we're fortunate enough that – the conference is deep enough and strong enough overall to, to be able to do that. Again, you have to be intentional about how you're scheduling your yeah. out of conference opponents, but it, it can be possible if you do that. Yeah. That's another interesting conversation, right? Just overall influence on who gets how much effort they go to, to get people into the conference. Right. And do they set you up for success in the, in, in that regard? Um, Maybe I'll interview a commissioner if I can get one. Yeah. Um, hey, how big of a deal is, and in your coaching is, um, is team culture and sort of building, I'll just say something special for players to come into at Hampton, Sydney, and, and, and some of the things that you might do to sort of foster that. Yeah. So, I mean, that's a critically important part of it. Um, and I think it's, it's got to be at the forefront of everything you do. And if that's not the case, um, th then you're missing out. And I think the reason that, uh, you know, I'm in this profession is because thankfully when I played at Mary Washington, our, our head coach there, 
did a great job with that. Uh, the guys I played with are still my best friends today. Um, and then when I went to Lynchburg, I got to see it even on another level. Coach Jager there does a great job with that. Um, and, 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 and put a lot of things into place that I had never really thought about before. He was just very intentional about doing those things at that time. So that stuck with me. And then both times I've come into programs where the foundation need to be relayed a little bit. That was the case at UMF. That was the case here at Hampton Sydney. Um, and, and that was a part of it. You have to, um, get to know these guys. You got to get them together off the field, uh, and that type of thing. And you got to show them how much you care. So I think that's done on a daily basis. It's a lot of people talk about it, but really it's about your actions. It's the attention to detail. It's um, finding different ways to, to connect everyone within your program. Um, so yeah, that, that's critically important. And uh, that, that's what it comes down to. You have to do those things if you want to maximize your, your team. Um, not to mention, it's more fun that way. We, we enjoy being around these guys. We have a great group right now. We have, we've had that for years now. Um, so yeah, without a doubt, we want to keep them connected. We want to have a great environment that, that they enjoy coming to every day. We don't want it to be a drain to be a part of this. Yeah. 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 That, that to me is there's nothing worse than soccer without sort of any connection to others on the team or to whatever you're playing for, whatever shirt you're wearing. Right. And it's just, it's just blah. Um, you, you mentioned something, and I'm and I'm just I'm just curious. When you took the job, did you? I mean, what was it? A little bit of a rebuild that you had to do, or re reconstruct, or yeah, uh, definitely. And um, I think for a variety of reasons, like that previous head coach before me is a great guy, and he's a great great coach. And I think uh, there were some things that weren't in place here during his time that thankfully were in place while I was here. Um, I also felt like, um, again, I'd been lucky enough to go to Maine, uh, have a great support system in place. And I learned a ton about going into a program. I, you know, when I got there, we had like 15 guys in the program. They had won, uh, this is in Maine, and I uh, had won two games the year before. So you're really starting from square one and having mm -hmm. to build it up. So having gone through that already, was really, really important for me and in those like lean years where we didn't have much success early on, I learned more in that time than, you know, all my other seasons coaching combined. Um, because you have no choice but to kind of reevaluate everything, kind of question everything you're doing. Um, and I think when you're having success, that that's not a natural thing to do. Um, so I learned a ton from that. I was able to apply some of those things I learned there um, to Hampton, Sydney when I got here for sure. Yeah. When you, what's your sort of main area do you recruit from? Is it, is Hampton, Sydney, like, a, does it have a national footprint or regional? Yeah, so they're trying to make it more national. I'd say now at this point in time, mm -hmm. our roster generally is half Virginia, half North Carolina. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, and it's because um, we're only two hours from Raleigh. We're only two hours right. from Greensboro. Um, and, and, you know, we're only an hour from Richmond, Virginia, um, not too far from the Tidewater area. But having said that, um, in recent years and in next year's recruiting class, we have, you know, players coming from Florida, Georgia, Tennessee. So um, because of um, what we have to offer here academically, and it's a really good mix academic-wise, um, athletically, and then our alumni network is third best in the entire country. That's a pretty good selling point too. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, we're certainly trying to expand our footprint a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, not that that's a bad area to be recruiting from North Carolina and for right? Like, you don't have to go very far to find talent that 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 can play. That's for sure. At least in my experience. No, I, I, absolutely, absolutely. But yeah, so now and, and again, and I think that's part of it too. Like in our conference. Um, there's so many great schools and there's so many options. So many times when you recruit someone from North Carolina or Virginia, you're competing with the same ODAC schools or uh -huh. some of these other schools in Virginia. So sometimes when you go outside of that, um, you, you can be successful. And, and some of the guys in the conference have been doing that for years. Hey, uh, it's just totally random question, but because uh, I, I was thinking about a conversation I had a couple weeks ago where we were talking about the who you end up 
competing with for players. Do you do, are are you competing? I mean, do you mostly see ODAC? Other ODAC schools vying for the same talent. Are you are you um, competing with uh, Division One schools that might be of interest? Yeah, it's it, it's both. Um, I think some of the you know like for like type schools in the ODAC for us, what we do run into pretty consistently. Um, we absolutely do run into situations because we're trying to recruit high level Division Three soccer players. Mm -hmm. So. Many times their choice is come here, have an important role, or accept an offer at a Division One school and, and be a mm -hmm. roster guy and, and kind of mm -hmm. go from there. Um, and I'll mention this because I think, was, did you have Tony Pasella on pretty recently? Yes, yes. Yeah, yeah. So a few years ago. Great so guy, long, yeah. <laughs> he's great, he's great. And I'm not just saying that because, you know, this is being filmed. But Yeah, he's yeah. But, uh, a few years ago, Sawani maybe was – the, the school we ran into the most from mm -hmm. a recruit standpoint. Um, and then uh, we were able to hire their top assistant coach. And <laughs> so that has shifted a little bit yeah. um, just because Pat uh, Bain, our associate head coach, just does such a great job leaving no stone uh -huh. to turn. So he was yeah. in Virginia a ton. Yeah. So that, that shifted a little bit. We run into those guys on occasion though. And then yeah. ODAC schools, I would say primarily. Primarily. Which I got to ask this question because you because I sort of brought it up, but do you see in the on the recruiting trail a lot of guys who have that D one or bust mentality, like they're going to play D one, come hell or high water, or they're just not going to bother? Um, I think when you get that, generally it's from some of these like very elite clubs, mm -hmm. um, and I'm not not necessarily talking about. You know, I'm talking about like DC United or places like yeah, that. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. Because just because everyone around them is going to, you know, try to be a pro or they're going mm -hmm. to insert big time ACC school or whatever mm -hmm. it might be. So I think sometimes you see that and they get caught up in it. But I do think that um, now we're seeing that that kids are more well versed in the recruiting process. They understand mm -hmm. the benefits of, of going to a Division three school and going somewhere where they can have a great, well rounded experience. Mm -hmm. So I, I think it, it's a more open-minded process from a lot of these guys than it was a few years ago. And then I also think some of their, whoever it might be, the recruiting coordinator at a club or their coaches um, have a better understanding of the value in going, you know, mm -hmm. to a D3 school and, and right. you just get so much more out of it. If, if you're just going to go somewhere and be a fringe guy for four years at a division one school, yeah. why not go to a D3 school, compete to start right away and, and, and have some success hopefully. Yeah. How many uh, how, how many freshmen do you think on average get like I'll just say significant playing time at Hampton Sydney is it you know you have usually three guys who are contributing who just walked on or four or five So a, a year by year basis for sure but for us we don't care what year guys are the best players mm -hmm. are going to play this past season um at a certain point uh our, our nine, our seven, our 11, and our six were all freshmen starting. Um, mm -hmm. and, and we've had that in the past too. So no, we, we give opportunity right away. We anticipate from our class next year, a couple of the freshmen coming in, we'll, we'll start mm -hmm. right away or, or be competing in those roles. So no, we, mm -hmm. we want that. We, we don't want it to get stale. We want it to be every mm -hmm. single year. Guys are coming in and, and, you know, competing for starting roles and pushing some of the returners. So mm -hmm. I think our, our returning players understand that now that they have to earn it and continue mm -hmm. to earn. Yeah. That's healthy. I'm telling you, I'm tell them like, I, I think, I think a failed recruiting process yields you very few to no freshmen having an, some level of impact uh, during game days. Um, just because if anything, it just pushes the older guys and, you know, definitely, I, I, psychologically, I think seniors need to be pushed to get that sense of, hey, I'm, nothing's guaranteed, especially, right, because they, oh, four years, no, nothing's going to happen, and they need to be pushed in that regard.
Uh, absolutely. And, and that's the question you asked is a question we get constantly from recruits and, you know, mm -hmm. we give them the same answer I just gave you. And then we always tell them to please fact check us, check our roster, check our website. Yeah. Don't just look at last year, look at the past yeah. six years and, and you'll see that consistency. It's, it's always yeah. like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and true, it's like a really, that's a really positive thing for, hey, you know, no guarantees, but thinking I could, I could get some time. Like, whereas, like you said, I hate to say, and I hate to be, right, like the top half of the Division One table is for a very select group of players, whether... And I'm not saying there's always diamonds in the rough that show up. I'm not dismissing those. But by and large, those guys that end up there have a certain pre pe pedigree that you kind of knew that's where they were going to end up. It's like everybody else is you're just hoping against hope. And if you think every school is like UNC or Maryland or whatever, I and mean, you got another thing coming, right? Like it's just that's just not the case. But And, um, and, we, and we talk about that in the process too, like, mm -hmm. just like in division three, there's whatever it is, 400 some odd programs. Yeah. That's a massive spectrum from yeah. you know, the top to the bottom of, yeah. of, of you know, quality of, yeah. you know, school to resources to, to everything. And it's like that in division one and division two as well. Yeah. So yeah, it's yeah. not just a blanket. I play division one, I play division three. Yeah. There's a massive range in the spectrum. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, arguably, and you could you can make a case like there are Division One programs or Division Three programs that um, that could rival, and I would argue in terms of the soccer as well, could rival a mid mid Division One school, not only not only for the soccer but facilities, commitment by the university or the college, and and, and that. Um, Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, hey, what was your, somebody were to ask you, like, what's your overall assessment of the season? How do you think it went? Yeah. Um, so this past fall was an interesting one for us. I mean, I guess just to give you a one word answer, I would say disappointing. Um, really? And uh, we, you know, we started the year great. Um, and had a lot and, and you talked about it we had some very impactful freshmen come in mm -hmm. um and uh and the team was in a good place and then we went through a little lull where we had a couple games where even though we played well we didn't get results and then we ran into some really good teams and then it was kind of up and down from there a little bit um we had to make some adjustments we had some injuries um and and you know we at the end of the season we had a good win in the conference tournament and got to the conference semifinals. But, um, yeah, I'd say overall it was disappointing with, with the way we started and kind of that lull we went through in the middle of the year. And uh, so I, I don't think we reached our potential or our full potential this past year, but um, I think we learned a lot from it, and it set us up to have had a really great off season. And uh, I think our guys are incredibly motivated. So I think it's disappointing and frustrating to go through something like that, but you can learn a lot from it. Yeah. Um, it can be a powerful thing, so we're hoping that's going to be the case for this fall. I mean, <laughs> that's the interesting thing about the ODAC, right? Just the talent level. I mean, and look at and your overall schedule, right? I mean, you you play Christopher Newport. I mean, that's a that's no easy game. Washington, well, and, obviously, but go ahead. And and you were talking about some of the schedule scheduling like nuances of the ODAC. Mm -hmm which is interesting. And we've talked about loosely like adjusting our conference tournament too, and, and how it's done to help with strength of schedule. But, um, super unique thing. We, uh, at Hampton Sydney, we have been in the first round of the ODAC tournament and we've been in the one versus eight game four mm -hmm. years in a row. So <laughs> we were the one seed two years in a row. Yeah. And then we've been the eight two years in a row. Yeah. Um, and we've won three of those four games, but, uh, we could have lost all four um, yeah. as, as the one or the eight. And it's just, yeah. it's that tight across the board. Yeah. Um, so it's, it's incredibly competitive, but yeah, once you get into the tournament, it truly is a situation where yeah. anybody can beat anyone. Um, so yeah, it's, it's tough. Well, I, I'm just looking at, I mean, 
you played Lynchburg, you lose to them one nothing at Lynchburg. Three days later, you go back to Lynchburg and then you beat them one nothing, right? Like it's that. That to me just tells you how tight it is. Yeah, and and, and we might have played them better um, in the game we lost. So go. go <laughs> The soccer gods, holy smokes! <laughs> that's, that's that's right. So no, yeah. it's 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 crazy. But that that's what we enjoy about the conference too. Mm-hmm. When I first, so having come from Mary Washington, um, they were part of the CAC back then, which mm-hmm. is no longer a conference, unfortunately. Yeah. Um, the landscape shifted a lot, but uh, it was a really strong conference back then, um, with like York and Salisbury, um, who were national powers at the time. Uh, and a few other really good programs. Mm-hmm. So I, I came from that um, and went into the ODAC with Lynchburg and right away got well-versed and, and every game is, yeah. is a battle and every game is very difficult and just physical. It's a lot of times transitional in nature. Um, so yeah, n- nobody's afraid well, of anybody. Well, I think it's too, right? Like it's like, it's, it's another conference, like most conferences are just like, they, they become a little bit like bloodbaths, you know, like, hey, we're just going to, and I don't mean this to say that there's no soccer being played, I just mean like just the competitive nature of it, and it, it ends up being where you just come to blows every game, every game, because, again, you're only playing a limited number of games in conference, and so each game is just vitally important, right, and it's just critical that you get it right. If you want to succeed, you have to have to position yourself in such a way that you know that that you can give yourself a chance to at least make the tournament and then and then try to try to play. You, you know, get a couple of bounces your way. And next thing you know, you're the champion, right? Like I think it's that seems to be that tight. And um, it, it it truly is. And I've been a part of. Like I just said, seasons where we were the one seed and had 13 yeah. wins or the eight yeah. seed this year. Um, yeah. And those seasons like weren't that different. It's just uh, a couple of results here, there, yeah, yeah. a couple yeah. unfortunate moments. Granted, there, there's always things when it when you boil it down to the fine details of it and, and your mm-hmm. daily environment and certain things that can be controlled better. Um, yeah. But within the games themselves, it, it really wasn't that different. Yeah. I will say, right, like, it, it just my watching these games, right, I mean, sometimes it does come back. The difference between the number one and the number six is just how, how, how those moments where I'll just loosely define as luck go, right? Like, you can be on the receiving end of some really good luck, whatever it might be, you know, a call that's not made, ball goes – right call that is made like stuff like that and if you build that and it gives you enough momentum right like and then the number the number six team can be the one that's the recipient of the bad luck right like and it could just be that simple right you're you're still scoring goals you're doing all but you're on the losing end of games that you're like man we were just unlucky right and i think that's real i think that's real especially most conferences I'll always say the top, you know, the two thirds of the conference, that's what's in play, right? And, and, and I think you just said it too. I think momentum's such a big part of it. Yeah. Um, and, and we went through a stretch where we, we didn't lose a game for 23 yeah. in a row um, yeah. during our unbeaten run a couple of years ago. And during that time frame, after we got the first eight or nine under our belt, it was just never in consideration that yeah. we could lose. Um, yeah. And then once it does happen, it kind of shocks you a little bit, um, and, and you got to kind of deal with that differently and learn from it. Yeah. Um, but you know, the opposite side of that is when you lose a couple of tough games this year, like yeah. we did, yeah. you feel like you're never going to win again. So it yeah. changes very, very quickly. Quickly, yeah. Well, that's that. That's why too. Like you talk about scheduling, like you can make or break a season. Psych- mentally, psychologically, all those things. You could have the best soccer team, but you can make or break most teams. Like there are the rarities, like Ohio Wesleyan turned around their season, which, right? Like yeah. you can go, the first five games can dictate your season, right? You could be done at five and be like, we're taking on the world. Or you could be done at five and just be like, 
when's the season going to end, right? Like, that's the type of feeling you get. And that, trans to me, that always translates on the field, right? Whatever that mentality is, it just gives you either the extra energy or to be like, yeah, I'm not just not going to try as hard or whatever the case may be. That's um, amazing. And, and since you brought that up, so I'll, I'll say that back, back in 2019, we did start the season one and five. Yeah. Um, and we, we played a really difficult schedule, to be fair. Um, I don't know, Johns Hopkins, yeah. uh, Haverford, <laughs> schools like that. Great, yeah. great schools. And we knew it was going to be a difficult start. Right. And, and even though we played well in some of those games, um, we just didn't get results. And we started one yeah. and five. And then we went on a, whatever it was, a 13-game unbeaten run yeah. from there. But we learned so much in the early part. But 100%, we were kind of in that gray yeah. area of th this could go either way. Yeah. Um, but uh, the leaders in our program at the time handled it really, really well. Yeah. And uh, it, it set us up for the rest of the year. But it, it could have gone differently if we didn't yeah. have the foundation we had and, and we didn't have such a great group of resilient players. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I've, I've seen that side of it but, too. But it is, yeah, but it is like a fine, like you said, it's like a fine, like there's a moment where you're like, man, we can, we could either crush it or just it's over like it's just there's nothing we're going to be able to do like you're there there are moments and i think like i said that pre not, not the preseason the the out of conference that conference. first stretch yeah the non-conference games at the beginning that's so much and that's the interesting trick right and i could un it's i don't i don't want to say damned if you do damned if you don't but it's almost like hey I'm going to guarantee that we're going to be 5-0, and 6-0 and at the beginning of the season. I'm just going to make sure the schedule allows us to do that. Well, you do that, that's great, and you might have this momentum. I think it's a little, probably a little, you know, it's almost like, well, that's a way to do it by using steroids, right? But your strength of schedule then gets cr cripples you in case you can't make win the conference, which you go into a tournament and it's like, yeah, all, all bets are off. Or, hey, we're going to ensure that we have the strength to schedule to make the conference, and we're going to load up on the front end with these non-conference games. And then you end up 0-5 because you played these top, top programs that you just can't compete, right? Like I said, it's probably like this little bit of a balancing act, but... Yeah, and I, and I think as, as you've been somewhere, like in my first year at Hampton Sydney, we would not have done that. Um, yeah. But when we, that was my third year, when we made that schedule, I remember talking to my assistant coach at the time when I was putting it together and he was like, don't do this. He was like, <laughs> he was like don't do this. He's like, there's no reason for it. Um, yeah. And we could be in a position where we start the year 0 and 6 or 1 and 5 or whatever it is. Mm -hmm. And my counter argument was, well, I feel like no matter how we start, we can come out of it if necessary. Um, and we're going to need to be able to have a mentality like that to, to have a chance this year. Yeah. So, um, yeah, it's, it's, it's worth the risk, but, uh, yeah. I think you have to get, you have to get to know your team a little bit and understand they have yeah. that in them. Um, and then also have confidence in your coaching staff too. Yeah. You guys can stay resilient in those moments yeah, as yeah. well. I do. I do think too, right? Like if you look at all the good team, uh, good teams, right? Those who are consistently, I'll just say top. 25 30 they're not playing easy schedules and they're scheduling the toughest games they can and i think that's how they end up to a certain extent staying good right like again i just go back to iron sharpens iron right you're never gonna win and i'm convinced maybe there's that one chance this upcoming year will be that chance because i'm going to say this like you're never gonna win a national championship by by playing teams that you know you could put five on. You, you know, right? That's not gonna get you to the national championship. Yeah, um, no, so. it, it, it it doesn't make you better. So yeah. I, that's that's how you find out about your team and those real moments of adversity. Even this yeah. season when we went through our lull in the middle of the year, we learned a ton about our guys for better or worse, and about our yeah. leaders for better or worse. And um, at a minimum, whether you get it turned around or not, I think it articulates a lot of, um, you know, what your potential underlying yeah. issues are within your team. Uh, yeah. And you can act on it and, and learn from it and tweak some things. Yeah, um, yeah. So it brings a lot of stuff to the forefront, which I think in the long run is, is really good to deal with. Yeah. 
All right, that was a little bit of a – we went off on a little side sure. note there. That was good. Um, I love thinking about these things, right, because, again, you're – Again, you're not just you're not just coaching twenty some odd thirty guys on a soccer field, right? There's so much more that goes into how do you build a successful program. So, like I mentioned, the culture earlier, but also the scheduling has the huge impact on sort of what you do. Um, hey, any highlights for you come in, come to mind for this past season that you're like, man, if we could capture that moment, like we're unstoppable. Yeah, I mean, definitely. We 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 had some great great moments this year. Um, I mean, the ones that come to mind. I mean, obviously beating Lynchburg at their place uh, in the conference tournament because we've had quite the rivalry with them in recent years. It's been very competitive, very back and forth, and it's always close games. Mm -hmm. um, so that, that was a, a good moment for us. Also, earlier in the year, we went to Lexington, and we beat Emory and Oglethorpe back-to-back. -back. Mm -hmm. um, and the Emory game in particular, we, we just came out flying and scored four goals in the first half. And then they, they, they made a game of it from there. But, um, yeah, we, we had some moments like that where we felt like we, we showcased what we're truly capable of. Mm -hmm. uh, so I, I would say those jump out for sure. That that must have been a good trip, a happy trip. Uh, Emory and Oglethorpe. <laughs> yeah, no, it was it, it was a great weekend and very very competitive, and we knew it would be like that. Yeah. Um, but no, the, the guys rose to the occasion. Um, yeah. So we we were happy about that. Um, and then there, there and there's plenty of other moments too. But I I would say that that tournament weekend there in Lexington, and then the game at the end of the year, particularly. Yeah, yeah. Hey, with the. I mean, you had you went nine seven and three. You had the three ties. I, do you what What are your thoughts on the no overtimes? Is it something you like? Would you like to go back the old way? Um, I'm not really sure. I, I do think it was really strange when you're watching other teams end the season with eight or nine ties. Um, mm. That's an odd one to me. <laughs> and something I guess we all just need to wrap our minds around if it's going to be like that. Mm -hmm. But I, I do think that um, once you get into overtime, at least in the past, like there wasn't much tactical about it. It was yeah. just like who can kind of sustain here, um, mm -hmm. and some strange things happen because of it. So I'm I'm okay with it, I think. But um, no, it's, it's still an odd thing, and it's something um, too that. Uh, as coaches, we have to make some adjustments, kind of with how you manage games, yeah. knowing that that is the situation. But I'm I'm okay with it. But it, it is a really strange thing to see yeah. a team go like six, four, and ten, or something like that for their <laughs> season. So yeah. nobody's used to that just yet. Yeah, yeah. Hey, did you do you did you do you think you changed the way you coached those games, knowing that you weren't going to OT? Either hey, let's throw caution to the wind, or Hey, let's lock it down. Yeah, it, it, it kind of depended what side of it we were on. So mm -hmm. there were absolutely situations where, you know, we, we really, really had to go for it even more so um, and that type of thing um, and, and, and then vice versa. So, no, for, for sure. And I think it's just how you – it's also more for me about kind of managing your players as far mm -hmm. as thinking along the lines of do we want to put so-and-so back in the game we're probably going to need him for overtime too, and now that's not yeah. a consideration. So that that's probably the biggest thing for me with mm -hmm. that. Yeah, yeah. I I always like the. It's another equation that you're thinking through in a game, right? Like it this it just becomes another data point to oh, what am I going to do here in this situation? Well, we don't have overtime, right? Do you risk a player? Or do you not risk a player? Like I'm sure that that plays into it. Um, all right, so are, are you're done with your spring, right? I mean, you're you're done uh, with your spring suit, yeah. Yeah, um, we, uh, we're we're in exam week here, so things nice. are going really down here at Hampton Sydney. Nice. Um, did you have any set objectives for your spring season? Were there things that you were trying to accomplish? Definitely. So th there were a couple. Tactical things, technical things for sure um, that we kind of highlighted after rewatching a lot of things from the fall. 
Mm-hmm. So we kind of implemented those f- from day one. Um, but honestly, the biggest thing, kind of like what I've hinted at before, is when you don't have the type of season you, you really wanted to have and you don't think you've maximized your group, um, a lot of times it goes down to the finer details. So for mm-hmm. us, it was an opportunity to kind of get things right on a daily basis, whether that might mean you know, keeping our locker room organized and looking good at all times. Mm-hmm. Um, or, you know, our, our etiquette in the weight room when we'd go in as a team, um, or even our, our training environment and keeping our training sessions at, at a fast pace. Um, and a lot of that was stuff that our coaching staff needed to adjust and do a little bit differently. Mm-hmm. Um, but again, just kind of really analyzing our, our daily environment and looking at it in different areas, whether it's the weight room, out on the field with community service, whatever that might mean, and then being able to implement some things. I think the spring's a great time to, to try some of these things out and, and see what sticks. So we were able to do a lot of different things like that, but but really it, it was, wasn't as much soccer related as it was us controlling our environment a little mm-hmm. bit better. Yeah, um, yeah. The, the other thing that we, we put in place this spring was, um, and we've done this in the past a little bit, but we were able to do it more consistently this spring, was we were able to videotape every single one of our training sessions. Um, and again, it just articulated a lot of things with our environment and how we were managing things um, within the training session uh, and gave us a closer look and assessment of some of our guys too. Mm-hmm. And a lot of times in the fall, we don't have time to, to do that. I can't watch back every training session you know, um, in great, great detail because we're preparing for the big ODAC game we have on Wednesday. Yeah. So the spring allows you to do that, and, and I learned a ton from it about our guys individually, about our coaching staff, um, just all of it. Yeah. All right, I got to ask because I could ha- – how many conversations did you have or do you have when you have the ability to watch your practices where someone says, man, I really worked hard and I, and I think I was awesome – and then you watch the videotape and it's totally not what you are thinking. Yes. So 100%. (laughs) So you get caught up in, you know, like an individual moment from someone like where they, you know, scored a goal. Scored a banger. Yeah. Yeah. From like 20 yards. And then you leave the session and you're like, man, that guy was great today. And then you watch back the rest of it and they weren't good. Um, Yeah. So I, I think it, it lets you see the whole picture. I think it's mm-hmm. you know, human instincts to get wrapped up in those individual moments yeah. or get wrapped up in what happened at the very end of the session. Um, yeah. And you just forget about all the stuff that happened the previous hour and 15 yeah. minutes. Um, so it was great to watch this stuff back. We did video with our guys too. And we're showing them the, these moments from sessions and, and even stuff you pick up on with certain players like fading as mm-hmm. sessions are going on or vice versa, easing yeah. into it and being able yeah. to have conversations like that and yeah. show them video proof. It's harder to do yeah. that um, when I'm just saying, hey, I think you started slow today. They yeah. can brush me off pretty easily, but when you're actually showing them, um, this it's is how slow it was. Yeah, yeah. Can I ask you, this is, ha- has it, this past season, does it make you appreciate certain guys who you know, there's always there's there's always there's guys on a team that you know are what what for whatever reasons, right? That like the attention is on them, they're they get the ball a lot, and then there's that other those other guys that are key cogs in the whole thing, but have a much more subdued. Did did you find appreciation for guys like that on your? Not, not having one. I think I watched the Lynchburg game where you guys won. Um, but other than that, I haven't watched. Do you, do you do you see guys that you're like, man, that guy adds so much to the game and you wouldn't know it unless you, you, you paid attention? Yeah, I, I, I think definitely. Um, and uh, I think you see that a couple different ways sometimes, whether it's in games or from rewatching these training sessions. Um, and then the, the other thing that happens over the spring um, is the guys like you're referring to that maybe aren't the flashiest player on the field yeah. but are still incredibly impactful and important. Those are the guys that generally have great off seasons too. Yeah. Um, so you see, like we, we talked about at the beginning of the spring, 
there's going to be guys in our program that come in in one place and they leave the spring in another yeah. because of the time and effort and the consistency of their work rate and everything they're doing. And we got a couple guys that didn't play much for us in the fall. Still were contributors, but had unbelievable off seasons. And yeah. uh, I'll be shocked if they don't start um, yeah. next fall. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I love hearing about that, right? Because it just gives you insight into not every, but much to a lot of clubs chagrins, at least in the youth game. Like, not every player on the field has to be like this, right? You need guys who do the dirty work, and you need guys. Anyhow, that's another whole path. Uh, uh, absolutely, absolutely. And uh, you need that, too, from yeah. from your best players. Um, yeah. And then it's a lot easier to, to get others to do the same. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, we'll do a whole separate podcast on that well i'll have every coach and we'll just opine on the on the youth game and club games from a college perspective um and uh, i'll sit on my soapbox you know because i you know because i have a really good soapbox um, um hey just a, just just a couple more questions and i'll let you get on with your day because it does look lovely down there looking at peering out your window yeah we got um, a great day here today for sure oh my gosh it's been it last two days it Lord, like crazy around there. So, um, hey, what's your your recruiting crap re recruiting class look like? Who do you, you know? How many guys you have coming in? Do you see some of the freshmen that you're like that guy can give us minutes? Definitely, um, we we think it's a really good group. I mean, as I as I mentioned already, um, our associate head coach Pat Bain mm -hmm. uh, takes the lead on a lot of this stuff. Um, and does an unbelievable job just leaving no stone unturned and, mm -hmm. uh, and getting guys to campus because we think once guys get here, um, generally they, they have a great impression and they see, yeah. like I mentioned already, how well-rounded of an experience it is. Mm -hmm. But currently we, we have nine committed guys, um, two from Florida, uh, wow. Tennessee. Tennessee. Wow. Um, I got the list behind me. It'd be way easier to look. Um, we got one from Maryland, a couple from North Carolina, and then a couple from Virginia. Um, so we, we think it's a well-rounded group, and absolutely guys are going to come in and compete to start right away. Um, mm -hmm. And we think a couple of these guys in particular could be very, very impactful um, yeah. and add a ton to our program immediately. But, um, again, hopefully they have great summers and, and great off-seasons. That's and, it. Uh, yeah. <laughs> you know, prove me right on all this. But no, we, we got nine guys, and um, – we might be adding. We might add one more to our class later today. Uh huh. Ooh, nice. Yeah. So nice. important conversation coming up later, and, and we'll see. But um, but 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 that's pretty much it at this point. Um, Florida, that you guys are getting are getting around now. So, Florida is such an interesting state, and I'm sure you know this from just yeah. like. A Division three landscape. Yeah, there's, there is none. Division, there's no <laughs> Division three down there. Yeah. So we, you know, we, we hear from kids from Florida a good bit. We we have some contacts mm -hmm. down there, and we think those kids are undervalued. Um, yeah. So um, yeah, we have a young man from Florida on our roster now who's been great. Mm -hmm. um, so so yeah, we're always. I mean, who doesn't want to go to Florida recruiting? So, <laughs> we have absolutely no problem doing that. We're always yeah. looking for excuses to go do that yeah, yeah, yeah fantastic um all right last one for you what what's and i get like you just got done with spring so maybe you really haven't thought but do you guys have any like i'll just say that you can comment publicly any goals for the fall or is it too early no i mean we we know as a program what we want to accomplish um every season uh and you know in the odak you want to be a top four team yeah. and if you do that you have a chance to compete for a conference championship and, and mm -hmm. have a chance to go to ncaa's so that that's always kind of like the general goal um and then we kind of go from there with with some smaller ones and um and what's going to get us to that point but um, it goes back to kind of what i've referenced already we just have to make sure we have everything in our environment mm -hmm. um kind of ironed out and guys are holding each other um to high standards because that's when we've been at our best and we absolutely have um you know a group of upperclassmen that understand um how things need to go here um to, to help us do that so no that's that's our goal and, and we think that that should be the goal here for for years to come um to yeah. compete at a high level like that and um like we've talked about already 
I mean, we, we had a tough schedule this past year, but the one coming up is a lot more difficult, um, <laughs> which, which again is, is, is what we want. Um, yeah. I mean, it's always going to be that way. Ah, got so, to, got yeah. to. So hopefully we can, we can, you know, maximize this group and help them reach their potential. And if we do that, we think we can have a chance to be pretty mm -hmm. successful. Yeah. Um, well, I do have one other question. Is it true that you have two game fields? You have a turf field and a grass field? So that's always like one of our, our big selling points here. Are you kidding we, me? So we, like, we have our own grass field. We share with absolutely nobody. Um, which is great. It's a great Bermuda field. It's, it's excellent. So that's one of the nice benefits here. Guys can mm -hmm. go up there and train whenever they want. Um, and then we have a turf field that we share with our lacrosse program. Right. So There's two teams managing it. Um, so that's almost always available too. So no, that, wow. that's one of the things about Hampton Sydney, that the facility side of things are unbelievable and, and make our life really, really easy. Yeah. So, I mean, just the fact that you have two game fields, really, I mean, I'm jealous. Now, I'm going to tell, like, I mean, I think I've verbally committed to at least 17 schools by now. I think I might verbally commit to you guys as well, just because I get to play on grass or turf, right? Like, There you go. Come, <laughs> come on down. Come on down. My grades are an issue, but otherwise, <laughs> well, you know, I could totally see that happening. So. Absolutely. Um, all right, Coach. Thank you. This was great. This was fantastic. I am. I, how how close to Richmond are you? Uh, we're about an hour from Richmond. An hour. So I I get down to Richmond on business. I might um, I might have to take steer my way your way to to check out the campus. It's. I mean, mm -hmm. some of the schools I've been to is just down there in that area, just absolutely stunning. So you you should let let me know, and I know uh, you at some point toward our rival up in Ashland. Um, yes, that that will remain nameless. But, uh, <laughs> but we would be happy to have you here anytime, yeah. for sure. Yeah, definitely. Um, so, anyhow, thank you very much. Do appreciate it, and um, maybe in the in the in the fall, well, in like August, we'll, we'll if you have time, we can connect and we can just talk about the upcoming season for a little bit. Yeah, absolutely. I'd, I'd be All happy. Right. To we'll get that. your assistant. We'll get him since he never stepped up to the plate, which I was counting on. <laughs> Is he there? I uh, told him. He's, a, he's in the next office over, but I'm going to repeat this to him immediately. <laughs> yeah. Well, this is recorded, so it's a, it's it's it's, a, it's a memorialized forever. Um, Perfect. Perfect. All right, Coach. Thanks a lot. Appreciate it. All right. Thank you very much. If you like this show, make sure you subscribe so you don't miss future episodes. You can also find me on anti-social media on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Thanks. This is a message from my chief marketing officer. I think this keeps him happy.